with the, the recording really quick. Um, so just uh, one thing that we like, we start uh, with every single meeting um, is reviewing the, the Hyperledger Code of Conduct as well as our antitrust policy notice. Um, this is really just more um, focused on making sure that Hyperledger is um, creating a safe and welcoming community for all. Um, so I do encourage, um, especially if this is the first time for you to join us um, today, um, just to briefly review this. And obviously um, all of this information is accessible at any point um, on our meeting agendas. Um, as well as right off of our uh, Hyperledger Social Impact SIG um, uh, wiki page. So please do take a, take a quick look at that um, and then we'll quickly get started in, a, in another minute. And Alicia, one quick thing, could you help me um, take note of all the participants that are on the call today? We just want to add that sure. to our agenda. I can do that, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. They're on there, okay, great. All right, so let's let's just get started for right now. Um, since we're going to be recording it, I think folks that can't make it today um, will be able to to also view it. Um, so just one quick announcement um, for the the overall team um, and the community is um, the Hyper Hack event um, that we're actually going to be co organizing with Hyperledger India chapter. Um, that's going to take place between March twenty first um, all the way until April fifth. Um, so if you know of any student groups that are working in Hacking for Impact, um, please um, encourage them to register. Um, and also, if you know of any corporate sponsors or university sponsors that might be interested in um, working with us on that, um, please do have them reach out. Um, so that could be a pretty interesting event uh, that we're going to be hosting. Oh, hey, hey, Bobby. Just saw you raise your hand. Yeah, real quick on that, I did talk to the people over at the Government Blockchain Association, and they are extending the deadline for submissions to August. So all the events in the hackathon will be um, able to apply for that award. Excellent, so, great, excellent. Um, I'll bring more information to the group next, next time we meet, but I definitely got it. It's definitely August would be the date for the submissions now. Okay, that sounds great. And then um, Bobby, I, I don't want to volunteer you for anything, but I was wondering if you would be interested in working with like the teams that are selected on helping position them for that award. Absolutely, no problem. Okay, I'll, 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 we'll definitely put you down for that. Thank you. And Arun, I think I just saw uh, you raise your hand briefly. Oh, that was this applauding. So thank, thanks, Bobby, for that effort. I look forward to more information from you. Thank you, Aaron. All right, so um, I think we, we're really here um, to talk about um, one a really revolutionary um, project that um, on the, the covalence um, carbon traceability story. And I think um, for the, the group here, we've had a couple of conversations about this. Um, I think we all noticed um, a, quite a few articles on this um, on the greater web. Um, oh, I just wanna make sure I'm seeing this. Oh, okay, awesome. So Karen's actually gonna make this live on YouTube. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. Awesome, I'm not, give you the not, guaranteed. not guaranteed. <laughs> if you cool. do, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet the link. Yeah, um, you know. either way we'll upload it, but um, uh, it, it, I've been trying, we've been trying to do this for our meetings now and, and sometimes it works because we have it's permissions thing. So <laughs> awesome. hopefully it'll work. So Karen, you are co-host right now. Do you want me to make you the host? I'm yes. Just sure that, uh, yeah, that's why I sent you the message. I need to be host to do it. All right, let me do this. So um, when Mark or I want to share our screen, do you have to make us like a co-host at that moment? I think, I think you should be able to, but I'm going to share their screen. Go. Yeah. I'm you should be able to see that. 
Yes. Do you, okay. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. okay. I do a button. Yep. Okay, cool. All right. Awesome. So Karen, should we give you a minute? <laughs> um, no, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. Sounds good. All right. So, uh, you know, I, I so, uh, you know, Deborah, like I reached out to you because, you know, we have been talking a lot about this project. Um, I think we have folks that have been working in the carbon traceability that are really concerned with some of these issues that um, this project is really targeting. And I think it's really putting as the forefront um, of, of the innovation on the blockchain end. So, um, you know, this has been something that we're keeping, you know, really, really interested in. We've been really looking forward to this uh, for a few weeks now. Um, I, I don't know if it would be best. So Deborah, would you like for me to introduce you guys or would you guys like to introduce yourself? Uh, we're flexible. <laughs> I guess we could. <laughs> I guess we can introduce ourselves. Um, All right, sounds good. <laughs> so uh, I'm Debbie Keston Schilkraut. I've been the global program director for blockchain ecosystem marketing and blockchain for good for the last few years, um, and I am very passionate about um, sustainability and making this world a lot better. And I'm thrilled to have with us uh, Mark Herrema from New Light Technologies and his genius and the amazing Ron Argent and Bill Stark, both from Cognition Foundry who are on with us today. Uh, one of our incredible business partners, very devoted to a lot of blockchain for good. So I'll have them each uh, say a quick hello here as well. Good, Mark. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, IBM has been a great partner for New Light and, and what we've been trying to do for the past few years, uh, as well as Cognition Foundry. So um, yeah, excited to, to talk about the journey that we've been on and, and what we're hoping to accomplish. Ron, I think you're on with us, CEO of Cognition Foundry. It just looks like you're on mute. Mm -hmm. All right. Ron's on mute, but um, Ron Argent is the CEO of Cognition Foundry. He's on with us as well. Um, and he's an uh, incredible, are you there? I'm sorry about that, Debbie. Oh, great, uh, go ahead. Technology was defeating me. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm Ron Argent, <coughs> CEO of Cognition Foundry. Um, <coughs> my background, so I had 31 years of IBM and that's where my, my my love almost my understanding of enterprise systems comes from and the last um last six years or so last six seven years been working with uh with startups to look at how we can use technology primary ibm's technology to help bring their ideas to life and to the market and uh met mark must have been four years ago now um love mark's idea and i could just see you know mark mark wanted to to bring blockchain onto the platform and I've been working with Mark since that point. Bill? Okay. So Nancy, should we just run into it or do you have other announcements? No, please proceed. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna share my screen uh, in just a moment here with just a, just a few slides as uh, an introduction. But um, first of all, we wanna thank uh, Nancy and, and the Hyperledger um, Special Interest Group here for having us here today. Um, IBM has had a longstanding commitment to the environment and being a responsible corporation as it pertains to the environment. And as I mentioned, I personally, along with my business colleagues here are really excited to share the solution with you. Um, and as it's been evolving, uh, all of us were kind of chomping at the bit, I think, to share the story. So um, as I mentioned, I've been leading blockchain for good initiatives at IBM. And uh, it's all about leverage, leveraging the technology, um, working with our clients and business partners uh, to help as many people as possible with critical solutions that support the UN SDGs and to have a positive impact on as many lives as possible. Um, so, um, you know, we've been hearing and seeing in a lot of the research that um, the Institute for Business Value that IBM runs, as well as other third party um, research organizations, really seeing that more and more um, of the consumers out there are seeing how important it is uh, to support a purpose economy um, and how important it is for transparency and responsibility in the products that we buy. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the time has come and is, is, is growing more in terms of the importance in this space. So again, really excited to, to share that with you. Um, so let me just see if my screen will share real quick. Um, and I'm not gonna take you through a lot of slides. It's just more of a uh, 
overview to set the stage here. And let me get into screen show. Okay. So as I mentioned, the UNSTGs, we're all familiar with it if you're on this call and you're in this group, um, but clearly consumers are speaking loud and clear in terms of believing that brands, 75% believe that brands can change society for the better. Um, and 55% of those that were surveyed, you know, feel that brands are a force for positive change. They're really looking for, you know, the companies today to be giving back positively to society. And 51% are willing to pay more for products and services from a socially responsible company. I've actually seen that 51% number go up in a bunch of other studies. So I'll probably update this slide next time I present it. Um, but IBM every year comes out with uh, five, uh, you know, areas that we, it's our research division that you know represent areas that we radically want to support and things that we predict um and uh, if you saw this from ibm in q4 of this past year it's about you know radically accelerating the process for enabling a more sustainable future so this fits right into that you know our mission as a company is to help our clients uh and partners change the the world and the way it works. Um, but we really also want to help support the UN sustainability development goals and uh, this whole issue around capturing and storing, transforming CO2 to mitigate climate change uh, is, is very much a big topic. So blockchain for good is really about having that single source of truth. I know I'm talking to the choir here, um, you know, immutable, tamper-proof results, um, you know, creating new models for change. Um, what we love about this new light uh, technologies uh, client here with us is, um, and Mark will tell you a little bit more about, you know, what, you know, what he's done and how he's, he's, he's brought it to life, um, is this vision about how, you know, the greenhouse gases can uh, be converted into materials that will help us improve our world. And I know that if you're sensitive about the environment like I am, you know, it's cringeworthy for me when I go places and, and you know, people automatically give me a straw, you know, if I don't want a straw. So my, my family and I have been very proactive when we have sat down at a restaurant in person when we can and we're not in COVID, uh, shut down to, you know, say up front, like no straws for the table, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, one of the two lines that New Lights put out is called Restore. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, again, a biodegradable uh, cutlery that's available. So the challenge here is really about, you know, the issues that we're facing with climate change and plastic and, and, and other you know, pollutants into our landfills and our environment and how the demand, unfortunately, for plastic in particular has been on the rise, you know, with all the shutdown that's been going on and people doing takeout. Um, <clears throat> we've seen all the extra, you know, containers and forks and cutlery and, and things that are being put out by the restaurants who are just trying to survive. Um, and then we've started to find restaurants on our own um, that are using, you know, biodegradable materials, or we're just trying not to water out at all, um, because we're just seeing that that demand has just been really impacted. Um, so anyway, the solution here is about identifying a cost effective, scalable solution to reduce the pace of things like plastic accumulation uh, in the world's oceans and in our landfills, and reducing greenhouse gas levels um, through this carbon capture process that you'll hear about. And where IBM blockchain comes into play is to validate and, and verify and create an indelible record about that transfer transformation of, of the greenhouse gases. Um, and then the other um, product line you'll hear about is, is covalent, uh, which is the one you've seen in our, our recent press release together with uh, New Light and, and, and Cognition Foundry um, for a sustainable alternative to the luxury fashion market and, and how blockchain can help track and verify that. So I, I'll make these slides available for you know whoever needs them for afterwards, but you know, you're going to hear now from, from Mark Harima, the co-founder of New Light, and then uh, who's going to tell you about about the technology itself and how it came to be and how it works. And then Ron's gonna share with you the technology stack and what he's put together with his team uh, to support um, you know, what Mark wanted to do with blockchain from uh, both a IBM blockchain platform as well as Linux One and, and System Z perspective. It's a really a hybrid cloud solution. So you'll hear about that. You'll have our contact information. And then, uh, you know, for more information and to go back, we've got these links for you in terms of our recent press release, Mark's recent blog, um, an interview um, that the three of us did together very recently in Q4, and other links to more blockchain information and how to reach us. So I just wanted to share uh, those things with you and um, turn it over to Mark uh, to tell you a little bit more. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to pull up my screen here. Just 
Just give me one second. Try also not to be defeated by technology here. Everybody see that all right? Yep. Okay, great. All right, so um, our story started uh, many years ago. <laughs> I read a newspaper article about uh, methane emissions from cows. And um, I've always really been intrigued by this idea of trying to solve problems by by finding the, the things that we agree on. Um, and, and that idea feels like it has um, become ever more pertinent today. But um, the idea was that, you know, when I read this newspaper article, it talked about how much methane each each cow was burping, um, of, of all things. And a, a lot of us, you know, we all know about methane from cows. But what was really striking about this article and what was different was that it talked about the specific amount burped per day. And that was about 600 liters per cow per day. Well, why that mattered was because it was quantifiable. And so you could, you could take 600 liters and you could do math. And you could say, okay, well, that, that equates to about $20 per cow per year. Well, that might not sound like a lot, but if you've got 1,000 cows, you know, that's $20,000 of methane into the air every year. And so what, what, struck, what struck me, and I, and I quickly called a, a friend, uh, my, my friend Kenton Kimmel, who was, he was studying uh, biomedical engineering at Northwestern at the time. And I said, look, everyone's talking about taxing or burying carbon, but this is also just a material resource. You know, what if we could find a way to take carbon that would otherwise go into the air, whether that's from methane or carbon dioxide, and use it as a resource and use it to make products? First of all, that's what nature does every day. But second of all, if we could do that, potentially we could come up with a consumer driven pathway to reducing the amount of carbon in the air, a way that we could all participate in, in trying to help uh, solve for, for too much carbon in the air. So it started with this article and, and it started this chain of thinking, well, okay, so there's a, there's a quantifiable amount of just material, material going into the air. Oops, being defeated by technology. Uh, and, um, and we also then said, okay, well, certainly for, um, you know, for farms, that's a big deal, but where else is this being emitted? And we looked at landfills and said, okay, there's a ton of methane being emitted from landfills. Well, what about all the flares? If you look at pictures of the United States uh, from space at night, um, you see these vast areas where there, of course, is a lot of light because they're cities, but then you see other areas that look just as bright and big as cities but in fact, there's no cities there. These are just flares. And so there's an absolutely enormous amount of, of carbon going into the air every year by virtue of, of flaring. And then of course, power plants uh, where, we're, where we're just putting um, massive amounts of carbon. And, and again, the sheer weight of carbon in, into the air. And so we said, you know, okay, right now we view this as a bad thing, but what if we, what if we flip the script? What if instead of carbon being just categorically a bad thing, what if we could turn it into a good thing? Um, and so we asked this question, what if, what if there was another pathway? And as soon as you look in nature, you find out that, in fact, greenhouse gas, uh, in, and in particular greenhouse gas in air and water, is in many ways the foundation of life. Um, and so you have these massive trees, and those are made by pulling this invisible gas out of the air. If you look in the ocean, this, these beautiful things that you see, these are all made by pulling carbon uh, dissolved from greenhouse gas in the water and pulling them out of the water and turning them into these, these uh, materials that we see. And then at the bottom of the ocean, you've got whole communities that are growing uh, off of, off of um, things like methane in the water. And so this, this, we find out very quickly that, that greenhouse gas is, is very much a part of creating and sustaining and growing life. Um, and so we said, all right, what if, what if we could mimic that? What if we could use greenhouse gas emissions as a resource? And if we did that, potentially have a pathway where in the same way that when you grow a tree leaf, it's a carbon negative process. What if when we carried out our process, the more materials we made, 
the more we improve the world. And so it was trying to take this sort of new paradigm that instead of being less bad, what if we could actually go to the other side of the column and create products that actively heal the environment or improve it? So we started with a, you know, a, a funny idea a long, long time ago. This was literally the, the, the garage where we, where we started. Um, and then we uh, found some university laboratory space and worked on the tech for a little bit of time, uh, about a year and a half. And then with that initial data and experience, we, we built our first pilot plant. I love this, this picture. Um, it was our, our empty room <laughs> when we started. Um, and we started to, to work the technology. It kept getting incrementally bigger and bigger. This was back in 2006 or 2007 when we were building out our, uh, one of our first pilot lines. And over time, we, we completed that and were able to show that we could operate a technology capable of turning greenhouse gas into a material. And I'll talk about what that, what that is. Um, so our, our, our goal was to figure out not just how to make a, a material from greenhouse gas, but, but most importantly, to figure out how to make something that could truly scale. And so what we learned early on was that there are microorganisms that exist in the ocean that eat um, methane and carbon dioxide as their food source. And when they do that, one of the things that they make is a really special material called PHB. Now, PHB is a molecule that almost all known life makes, and we, we all make it as a high, high uh, concentration energy source. So in fact, humans do it too. We're all, we have PHB in our, in our bodies right now, um, but plants and animals and microorganisms make this too. So what we set out to do was to figure out how to feed greenhouse gas using renewable power to these microorganisms and get them to make PHB at, at, at a, in a way where we could scale it and actually bring it out into the world. Well, this was a lot easier said than done, and it took us a long time to figure out how to do that efficiently. But over many years of work, we eventually um, kept improving the technology. This is what it looked like after a number of years of, of, uh, of effort. Uh, the, the line on the left was one of our first pilot lines, around about a, a half a football field in length. And then after a number of advancements, we, we figured out how to do that in about 30 feet of length. Um, and so finally, we had a technology that gave us the ability not just to convert greenhouse gas into PHB, this special material, um, in a cost-effective way, but also in a high-performance way. And so finally, we had a material here that, number one, is natural. Um, it's made in living things. Um, two, in part because of that, it's FDA approved. Um, and third, because it's made in nature, if it ends up in nature, nature sees it almost like a food source. Um, and so it degrades it just like it does a, a leaf from a tree. Um, fourth point, because we use renewable power and greenhouse gas to make it, we have a net carbon negative process. Um, and we'll talk about why that led us to blockchain. Um, but as importantly, because this material is a meltable material, you can use it to replace lots of things, including plastics. Um, that also makes it recyclable if there's uh, sufficient uh, material density in the area. Um, it's high strength. You can use it in hot and cold conditions. And at the end of the day, there's no plastic. So we're not creating microplastics and all the things that go along with that. So a really interesting material that is made in the ocean every single day. And, and we're now figuring out how to make it on land. So once we figured out sort of the, the basic uh, components of the technology, we kept working it, figuring out how to make it do different things, give it different colors, working our pilot plant. Finally, after about 10 years of work, we scaled this up to a meaningful um, uh, scale. So it went from a 10 foot tall reactor to what you see here, which is roughly a 50 foot tall reactor. And this was super important for us because not only did it show that we could operate this at, at commercially relevant scale, but also it gave us enough material to introduce products out into the world. And so we did that. We started to introduce uh, chairs made with air carbon, cell phone cases, to show that we could we could use this material to replace you know fairly large volume product types, um, but we also realized uh, something very important, which was that if this material ended up in the ocean, it would actually degrade as fast or faster than cellulose, which is the primary component of, of paper, and so it gave us these kind of two really big value traits: one, ocean degradability, and two, carbon negativity. Um, so we started by launching. Uh, last year, the world's first regenerative foodware products. So these are all made with air carbon. Um, there's no plastic in, in these products. So if they do, and we hope they never end up in the environment, but if they do, they'll go away like an organic material. Um, but in the meantime, uh, as, as Debbie was sort of alluding to, you can actually reuse these. These happen to be 
um, the molecule that we make just happens to be dishwasher safe. So you can reuse it over and over again. You don't have to throw it away, but if you do, it will go away. And, um, and that's something that that's really important to us. And sometimes people ask, well, how can it be dishwasher safe, but ocean degradable? Uh, the reason is that water doesn't do anything to the, to the, this molecule. Um, and so you can use it over and over again, in your dishwasher, it won't break down until it has microorganisms and nutrients to eat it. And so unless you're growing a, a chia pet off of your, your, your foodware products, um, it's not going to be breaking down. So really special product. And right now we've been launching uh, straws and, and, and cutlery and not just uh, great from an end of life perspective, but also these are regenerative products. So they have a net carbon negative footprint. Um, and we've been really excited to bring online our first commercial scale plant, um, what we call Eagle 3. And we did that last year. And that's now giving us the ability to really produce this material at, at larger scale and, 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 and help us create the impact that we wanted. But one of the really important impact areas that we also wanted was to show people um, that you can hold carbon that would otherwise be in the air in your hands. And if you can do that, we think it should cause people to ask, well, okay, if we can do that, why, why do we have to let carbon go into the air? Why can't we come together and help solve this problem? Um, and so this, this plant helps us, helps us do that. And one of the products that we've launched here is our uh, carbon negative or regenerative fashion. So this is um, air carbon leather. And it's something that's, that's really important to us because um, you know single use products are, are great and we, we are deeply passionate about trying to solve the ocean plastics uh, problem in this generation. But, but the oceans are not just getting destroyed from uh, plastics pollution. We're on pace to lose half of our coral reefs by 2050. And that's not because of plastics pollution, that's because of climate change and, and, and warming ocean waters. And so if you're going to address the oceans, you can't just focus on plastics. You also have to address the amount of carbon in the air. These products on a net basis reduce the amount of carbon in the air when we make them. Um, and uh, three years ago, we, we said to ourselves, you know, it's kind of hard to, to say that to somebody. And number one, uh, avoid what anybody should do, which is be a little bit skeptical and say, well, how do I really know? You're telling me these are carbon negative. Um, how do I verify that? And we recognized that that was, that was a, a problem. And also when I say, hey, look, this was a <laughs> long journey to, to make this. And, and also a lot of steps went into this. Um, it's, hard, it's hard for somebody to, to visualize those and, and really sort of make that tangible. And so um, we came across, a I can't remember, I think it was a news article or a web link or something about blockchain. And we said, you know, this could actually really be a great thing for us because with blockchain, we could do two things. We could we could help uh, convey the, the all the steps that went into making this product um, and do that on a very product specific basis. So not just generally what we generally do, but for that product that you're holding, what journey did it go on? Um, and then secondly, we'd have a way to uh, uh, basically tag each one of these products with its very specific carbon impact and do that in a third party verified way. And so what you see on the, on the bottom right here is, the, is a number, and I'm going to expand the screen here. Um, but this number is uh, what we call our carbon date, but, but you might also refer to it as our blockchain number. Because with this number, you can plug it into our uh, blockchain tracking system. And when you do that, you can see all the steps in the, in, in the process. So here's a more expanded view of that. And so this, this is a, actually a date. So you got your year, your month, your day, and then your, your hour, minute, and second. And so every single product that we make in the covalent space, um, they all have a unique uh, number here. And, and that time is associated with the time that the air carbon used to make this specific product was, was generated. Um, and so we, we have our website here. Um, we, we've launched a brand called Covalent. It's, it's based off of the Covalent Bond, which is the, the bond found in nature. It's one of the strongest bonds found in nature, but it's made by, by effectively sharing good. And that's really the, the basis of, of what, what we're trying to do with, you know, using greenhouse gas as a force or a source for good. Um, and so you see this little symbol up on the left here. When you, when you press that, it opens up this page. And this allows you to use blockchain to type in that, that carbon date on your product. You type it in. And when you do that, up pops a, um, your, your product. And so <clears throat> this, is the, uh, this is my wallet. 
And if I if I type in this number here, uh, my wallet comes up. So you see the the, the product type. It, this has a really cool uh, specific texture on it. Um, and then you can click through each one of these these areas. And when you do that, there's a little description. It also shows the exact date and time of of when these things happened. Uh, but perhaps most importantly for us, when you do that, it shows um, the exact carbon footprint, which in this case is negative 0.083 kilograms of, of CO2e, um, and then also who independently certified that. And so now when I say, hey, this is a carbon negative product, and you say, well, that's cool, but how do I believe that? I say, well, here, type in this number. And so um, it's so exciting to us because, uh, you know, a lot of times when we, when we think about products and their environmental impact, um, it, it, in many cases, it's a very generalized statement. You know, we're trying to be 30% less emissions or um, these are more sustainable materials. But I think there's a bit of consumer fatigue because it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? And also what about this specific product? What, what's in that? And so we're trying to sort of advance the conversation and say, what if we could use blockchain technology to kind of cut through some of the generalities and give people really specific information and, and by virtue of making it so specific, make it actionable. If, if someone knows that this t-shirt it, it results in the use of 700 uh, liters of water, and you can see that really clearly, and this t-shirt right next to it results in seven liters, um, it might not impact your decision making, or it might, but it gives you the choice. And, and we think, give people the opportunity to see the data, and then let, let them decide. And we think that, that that over time will lead towards consumers being able to really participate and, and change how things are done and, and thus change our impact on the environment. So we've been super excited to work with IBM and Cognition Foundry to, to get this set up. Uh, we launched it in September of last year and, um, and it's been really fun. It's been really joyful actually to, to see these products out in the world and, and be able to talk about how specific uh, they are in terms of, of their individual impact. So uh, I'll, I'll end there, but it's been, been a great journey and we, we've really appreciated our, our work with IBM and, and Cognition Foundry to get to this point. Thank you, Mark. So then we thought we'd have Ron um, share a little bit about the uh, technology stack that went into supporting this vision. So Ron, turn it to you. Thanks, Mark. Hi, Debbie. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Um, I love the word you use there, Mark, joyful. And uh, it, it really, I think it really um, says something about you as a character and why it's so, so lovely and remarkable to work with you. Uh, because, you know, what you're trying to do is bring joy into the world. And uh, so, so the relationship between Mark and uh, myself started, as I say, three or four years ago, when Mark said his idea, said what he was trying to do. And, and it was about, you know, about this trust and transparency. You know, how do you do that? And how do you engage with a large element of society, you know, the world? Because Mark hasn't talked about his, his, the extension of this idea, but it's, it's really how do you keep engaging with people? And, and not just on his own product range, but how do you do it beyond that? And how do you link things? So I heard, I heard a few things. One was the, the trust and transparency, which is uh, where blockchain comes into it. You know, blockchain being immutable shared data, uh, but also scalability and security was important. And you know, my, my background here <coughs> um, in IBM helped because you know, my, my whole career has been based around uh, building, working on uh, uh, scalable systems in banking, in finance, in government. And when someone's got an idea as big as Mark's, you know, to change the world, uh, you need big technology. So I just, when, when, we, when we first started, I just learned about, um, about blockchain. I know it's been around for some years with blockchain, uh, with, with Bitcoin, but Bitcoin was, had, had like bad press. It was all about, um, you know, speculation, all about using energy. You know, the amount of energy it takes to, to use one Bitcoin is the equivalent to, I think, a day's energy in Los Angeles it was the last thing I, I, I read. Um, so there was bits about, about blockchain that didn't quite fit with, with the message that Mark was trying to, to give. So I looked at it and thought, well, there's different ways of doing this. And I looked at different, different technologies. And the one that was just being introduced was a, was a consortium with IBM, Intel, Fujitsu, Itachi, lots of other people called Hyperledger. And this was 
it, it was a, a consortium of large organizations that looked at taking the blockchain technology into the future. And, and this was another element where I thought it fitted ideally with what Mark was trying to do. You know, having something that's future proof, not having something that just happens today, but having something that you can build on and that would grow at the same size and speed and scale that he wanted to. Uh, so, so we selected the Hyperledger uh, platform for, for our blockchain implementation. And in terms of uh, scalability and security, um, you know, my background in IBM said there was only one real answer for that, and that, and that was the, the traditional old mainframe technology that has been repackaged by IBM into something called Linux One. So it's exactly the same technology that, that enables the big, big banks, financial institutions, governments to scale up to tremendous scale. Uh, but, you know, it's very efficient, very green in its use. So, you know, whereas you might, you might require hundreds or thousands of servers in, in alternative implementations, uh, we use a single server to, to scale up very, very large ideas. So, so that really dictated the technology stack was, was to use infrastructure that was hugely scalable, hugely secure. So, you know, if you're working in a bank or a government, you want military grade security. Um, and this is what the, the IBM platform provides. So you get the security and the scale and more important than anything else, simplicity. Because as, as, as Mark shows, if you look at his, his initial diagrams, you'll see things were scaling up and he was putting another thing beside something else beside something else. So his initial factory was, was a row of things. And you imagine scaling that, that up to, to satisfy the huge, the huge demand that, that New Light is going to have and Covalent is going to have. So Mark has simplified it by condensing it down into a single thing and he's going to grow those things over and over. Uh, so the technology approach is very, very similar. You, know, you, don't, you don't scale out using small things, you use, use technologies that have got huge capacity for scale and use those because it drives down energy and it keeps things simple, which means all resources around the solution uh, are, are optimized. So the technology stack we use is the IBM Linux one, um, server uh, based on premise. So when we started, it was based on premise because of geogra geographical uh, considerations, because uh, Cognition Foundry is based in the UK. Uh, Mark and New Light are based in, in Huntington Beach in, in California. Um, we, we expanded into the IBM cloud. Uh, so we, we uh, supply most of Mark's computing from a data center in, in the US, but done in a very, um, in a very shared way with our on-premise solutions. So we've actually got a hybrid cloud solution where, where we uh, have got a seamless operation between our on-premise Linux One machines and the Linux One machines that are actually in the IBM cloud. Um, so that gives us uh, a rounded solution, uh, which means that we can, uh, we can implement new on-premise solutions if, if that's required. So if Mark, if Mark expands around the world, uh, he can uh, have on-premise solutions uh, to run this solution, or we can expand into the cloud. So in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, uh, and, and use the, the scalability and the uh, expansion that the technology can provide either on premise or in the cloud. I hope that was a, was a um, succinct enough explanation, Debbie, but if you need more information, I can, I can do some more. Yeah, that, that's great. I thought what we would do is open it up to questions uh, since we've each had a chance to share a little bit about about this uh, amazing uh, solution. So Nancy, if, if you want, we could um, open it up to questions. That sounds great. Um, so, you know, for folks that have questions, I think um, you know, you're welcome to message it or if you can just um, unmute yourself and you can directly ask. I just, uh, yeah, hi, thank you very much. I just had a really quick question. I was just thinking um, on your final verification, is that being set up as a non-fungible token or uh, does that just, does that give you access to um, the supply chain verification uh, points uh, that then resulted ultimately in that, in that bag, for example? Thank you, over. Hey, hey Mark, do you mind just quickly introducing yourself and, and yeah, my name is Mark Liberati. I'm working with the United Nations Volunteer Program right now, and I've been involved for over a year now, I think, with the um, with the SIG. Thank you. 
So uh, there may be a more technical answer uh, to your question, but um, I'll answer it from my perspective. The um, what what we've done is we've worked with a, a third party life cycle analysis uh, auditing company. Uh, in this case, with SCS Global, and what they've done is they've gone into for each one of our products, we've gone through a, a full LCA life cycle analysis, um, and so. Uh, in the course of the uh, data input that flows into the blockchain, um, one of the things that we also flow into the blockchain is the um, uh, the the lifecycle analysis associated with that product. So, um, I, I, I'm not sure how common it is to give consumers uh, the lifecycle, the LCA uh, associated with the given product. Um, or, or, or at all, but, but we do it and we do it with every single product and, and the specific one for the specific product. So what blockchain enables us to do is when you type in that number, you can access that, that very specific uh, report. And so I don't know if you saw on that screen or not, but one of the things that is there is a, uh, a hyperlink where you can see that uh, CS carried out the analysis. And then you can also pull up the actual report that they did on that specific product. Um, and so that, that goes into the ledger and that's, uh, forever associated with, with that product. Um, and so, you know, when we think about where does that go? Um, one of our hopes is that this, uh, obviously we can expand it to all the other things that, that we do, but, but we'd love to see this really grow in terms of a platform for other products as well. Um, you know, imagine, uh, if you're shopping, uh, and each product that, that you that you're looking at has a, a, a really easily accessible number and data set that you can pull up and um, and and get the LCA associated with it. And so you can see all the environmental impact, whatever matters to you. Um, you know, we're focused on carbon right now, but we also want to expand into things like water and power and and um, you know, whether it's the, how the community is impacted or there's, there's so many things that that uh, are exciting that uh, in terms of our ability to start measuring them, um, and, and by virtue of measuring, hopefully improving them. Um, <clears throat> so we'd love to see this, this concept of, of putting blockchain, uh, numbering on, on lots of things. So this is kind of where we've started with this idea of, of putting this number on there. Uh, but we really want to see that as a, as sort of a new standard. And I think in today's world, you know, never before has it been more important to to find ways to kind of cut through the noise, um, and and blockchain provides that sort of beautiful um, you know clear <laughs> clear call through that that says, look, this is data that can't be changed, can't be moved. Um, it's indelibly associated, and it gives consumers the ability to to really have that that information in a way that's that's so specific. So we're hoping that that starts to you know, go just beyond what we're doing and, and, and really um, impact and not just in community, but, but other, other product spaces as well. And, and I love, uh, you know, how Mark's explained, you know, that there's a lot of claims out there, you know, there's other products, you know, we call kind of greenwashing, but this is really authentic and uh, hopefully giving consumers confidence. Um, so for the Mark that just asked the question, hopefully we've helped address some of your questions, you know. Um, just one, one question that I want to, uh, that, that's in the chat, but also Mark, you've, Mark Hermerma, you've talked about um, is other thoughts and plans that you've got for, you know, for blockchain in the future, uh, other things that you have in, in the works, if you're willing to share um, from a consumer engagement perspective. Yeah, I don't want to give away too much yet, but um, yeah. we've got some exciting things that we're working on. And, um, and one of them is, is um, thinking about end of life. Um, so we encourage people that if, you know, we, we intend for these to be generational products. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that I, I never part ways with my, with my wallet here, but, um, if people do want to part ways, we, we encourage them to send their, their product back to us so we can reprocess it and turn it into something else. Um, and imagine if, if that happened for a lot of products and you could, you could start to see that the chains associated with that. Um, so we're thinking about giving people the optionality to be on the blockchain so that they're forever associated with the product. Um, obviously, there's privacy issues with that, so we have to work through that. But, but our our point is to is to just try to show that you know there is there is no way, um, and it's it's great to the more we can visualize that and make that tangible, I think it we it changes our 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 behaviors and patterns a little bit. 
Um, and we're also working on ways to, to help that inspire more connectivity too, to see how we impact each other with our, with our decisions. So it really, it's just about bringing more and more information to people, where, these, where things came from, where they're going, how they impact others. Um, and again, we think blockchain is a, a great platform to do that. Um, Ron or Mark, do you wanna talk about like kind of like the why IBM from a blockchain perspective? I mean, you talked a little bit about it, Ron, but you know. Yeah, the, so I'll come in on that one, Debbie. Um, yeah, the, so I've, I've had a close relationship with IBM for, for, for decades now, and uh, there's lots of trust. Uh, I see IBM as a great company, innovative company driving forward, um, and the way it picks up new ideas sometimes and, and takes leadership in the market and drives those forwards is really important. So when I saw you know, this, this particular opportunity of using Hyperledger to, to tackle not, not the financial bits, which is where people normally tend to think of blockchain as being a financial uh, tool you know, to, to generate cryptocurrency. Um, what, what we really use it for here is not, it's, it's, it's using it for social use. It's to, to demonstrate trust and transparency to people that, that you know, so much fake news that goes around nowadays. You know, what can you believe? What can't you believe? And the Cognition Foundry, we, we look at using blockchain to, to, to tackle some of those issues that people have. Now, can I believe what I'm being told? So in Mark's case, you know, who would believe that you can make a pair of sunglasses out, out of the thin air? You know, who would believe that? It's, it's, it's really difficult. So use the technologies uh, to, to show people that this thing is real. It's authenticated. It's, it's authenticated by, 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 by uh, people you can trust. Um, so looking at that, we thought, right, uh, Hyperledger is the way to go. Uh, IBM adopting the, the technology. But another key thing that I've mentioned before is it's no use trying to change things if you're going to ruin them on the other side. So I mentioned the example of Bitcoin, the way it uses energy you know, to generate a single coin. We didn't want to go down that line with that kind of technology. So we use technologies that are very efficient, very simple. You know, and, and that means you can design things that don't put a strain on, on, on the planet. Uh, so the IBM technologies are ideal for this. And that, that was a key reason that we, that we chose the IBM technologies. But it's also the case, and, and, and it's using... It's using the stories of the technology. So people like Mark, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous story for IBM to use to, to, to sell its technologies and to position its technologies as, as doing things for the world. You know, not just generating banking transactions or airline transactions or helping, helping newspapers run. It's, you know, how can modern day technologies be used to change the world? And I saw, you know, a, a desire within IBM to do that. And that's, that's one of the key reasons why, why I partner IBM in this space. I think for us, um, uh, the, one of the biggest things is about scalability. You know, we, we didn't set out to kind of create an acute science project. Um, you know, we, we set out to, to hopefully create as big of an impact as, as, as possible. And uh, for us, that entails scalability. And, so with this platform, we needed something that could really grow with us. We're looking to grow, you know, hope, hopefully pretty rapidly over the next few years here. Um, and, and so we had to, to come up with something that, that would enable that. Um, and IBM and Cognition were able to put together what we think is a, is a, good, a good platform that should, should enable that in a unique way. So um, that was really valuable. And, and um, I think we'll see the fruits of that more and more in, in, the, in the years ahead here. Hey, Debbie, I just had a, a quick question for Mark and Ron. Um, first and foremost, um, Mark, um, one thing that stood out is when you were talking about the vision that you had for Covalent, um, you know, given that it's the strongest bond and being able to share that good. And I think that's something that really resonates with the work that you guys have done. Um, on the other end, also, Ron, what you were talking about as blockchain, not just being a financial trans, uh, you know, tracking solution, um, but actually also being a single source of truth. Right, especially when you're looking at sharing that information across different organizations. I think those are a couple of things that really stood out. And I think e even more so, right, um, most of the, the hyperledger community can attest to the, the great work that IBM has done um, on, in the blockchain space. Um, I noticed in the articles um, that you guys talked about air carbon. 
um, and I was just one thing that I was kind of curious about, is, is that something that's um, a, a much more advanced form of uh, molten salt or is that um, something else where am I completely wrong with what I've um, understood? Um, so air, air carbon is the, the core of the business. Um, air carbon is the material that we make. So um, in part, um, we call it air carbon because by weight, it's about 40% oxygen from air. And then the remaining weight is, is carbon and hydrogen um, uh, that, from, from greenhouse gas. So, um, so air carbon is the meltable, moldable material that, that we make from either methane or, or CO2. Um, and it's, it's the, the material that we talk about that essentially flows in almost all known living things. And, and that really is the, the key sort of, I guess, ingredient as it were that, that, you know, flows through all of our products as well. Thank you so much, Mark. So there's a question in the chat. Uh, it says, Mark and Ron, are you working with any other companies to move product data across different platforms, for example, if air carbon products are sold through a retail outlet that also, <clears throat> that also has a traceability platform, which tracks some of the same data? I think it's a great question. And, and what it brings up is, okay, what's next? <laughs> uh, once you get the, the platform in place, um, all of a sudden you start to have a hundred other ideas in terms of how you can use it. Um, and, and this is a good, a really good example of that, you know, what if you could share it with you know, retailers and outlets and what, you know, how can you get, now that you have this sort of tool, um, and it's, 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 you know, tangible and, and, and in some level tradable and shareable, um, all of a sudden you can start to build. So we first need to get the, the platform in place. That was a, that was a, you know, it was, it was a lift. We had to get all of our operations fully integrated and on the platform. Um, data flowing, you know, there's put it into your supply chain. Every single one of these products, we have to individually uh, either UV print or laser etch these, these numbers onto our products. Um, so there is a, a, an important operational uh, lift to, to get there. Now that we've got that, it's like, well, how do you use that tool? And so this is a great question. So we don't currently uh, uh, work with our, you know, a, a retail outlet um, in part because right now everything's online. <laughs> so we don't have retail outlet yet. Uh, but once we start to have those things, then um, then I think that's a really good idea. And I, and I think uh, it's just the beginning. We're going to see some really cool stuff that, that, that comes out of it. Um, I also realized to, to the last question, I don't know that I did a, a great job answering it. So, so air carbon on its most fundamental level is this, um, it's a energy storage material and it's kind of like, um, like a fat or, or muscle that almost all organisms make it in response to a resistance, a, a stress condition of some sort. Um, so if we, if we, um, if we take microorganisms and uh, you create conditions where it's harder for them to grow, in response, they, they fill their cells with air carbon and we extract that. Um, and it just so happens when we extract it, we can melt it. And because it's meltable, we can use it to replace all these different parts and pieces, whether it's from plastic or leather or other things. Um, and so that's really kind of our core ingredient. Uh, in, 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 and that's why we say sort of air carbon within because uh, that's our, our, our core ingredient that runs through everything. And there's another question in the chat as well. <clears throat> um, so carbon emission certifications do need to comply with the regulatory requirements at times. Do you plan to cover or extend the use of technology uh, there and what challenges do you face there? And so I know you've got the third party already, the two third party companies that you're doing. But Yeah, we've had Air Carbon uh, independently certified by both uh, SCS Global as well as Carbon Trust. <clears throat> um, and when third parties do their life cycle uh, analyses, they all have to comply with uh, international regulations uh, so that their audit is... is um, uh, you know, meets, meets whatever ISO standard or whatever there is. So, so we already do that in terms of meeting uh, regulatory requirements. Um, and I think as the world evolves, those will continue to get tighter and tighter and tighter, um, but they're already pretty, pretty darn good in terms of, you know, having global standards associated with them. So 
to all the questions I see in the chat. So we're getting close to the top of the hour. First and foremost, I want to thank you all so much for taking the time um, to be here this morning. Um, really appreciate learning about all the great social good projects that are coming out from IBM. And uh, Debbie, we'd love to keep in touch if you have other projects that you'd also like to highlight. And as well, I think for Mark and, and Ron, we'd love to kind of keep, um, keep in touch with you guys to see how, kind of where you guys go with this. Because you know, I think this is really some transformative technologies and use cases that you guys are applying would love to like understand, you know, the, the direction and be able to highlight that on the, on this platform as well. Thanks for that. And thanks for having us. Uh, and we, we're really excited about what's to come. Uh, I think one of the, the things we definitely touched on today was that this is just the beginning uh, in so many ways. So we can't wait to, you know, keep working with you guys and, and, um, and talk about all the different things that we can do. Awesome. At, at New Light clearly has set the you know, the bar very high for vision and for the art of the possible with this uh, groundbreaking solution that you've heard. Um, um, so I just want to acknowledge, you know, Mark and, and his vision and his team, but also Cognition Foundry as well uh, as a key example of how an IBM uh, ecosystem business partner can enable the vision of their clients uh, by leveraging IBM blockchain and IBM Linux One um, for the greater good. So I just want to thank uh, the gentleman for being here and for all of you for enabling uh, us the time to tell this great story. And we are excited about, you know, how things will continue to evolve in this space. Thank Thanks, you everyone. so much. It was great um, presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank Thanks you. everyone.